This video is my second interview with Ron Pizzaturo about his book, A Validation of Knowledge. The purpose of this book is to answer the question, how do we know the things we think we know? Ron answers this question by proving certain foundational pieces of knowledge inductively, that is, from observation. Now, to achieve this ambitious task, Ron's book presents a carefully ordered set of observations and reasoning steps, each building off of the last, validating ideas which form a fundamental foundation for the rest of our knowledge. In this video, I ask Ron specific questions about his order of presentation since that order is a highly unusual one. Just like Opar, he starts with the concept of existence, but from there his order takes a radical turn. The order of his presentation is existence, part, whole, consciousness, causality, multiplicity, identity, and then the list goes on from there. But you can see it's a very unusual list. Now, the fact that Ron's approach is fundamentally different from other students of objectivism can be seen in the fact that identity is actually developed seventh in his order of validation. So that gives you some sense of how different this is. Ron takes sense perception as the given in his development and then explains the observations and reasoning steps that allow him to validate each of these ideas in sequence. The validation of the later ideas in the list relying for their proof on the earlier ideas in the sequence. Another feature of this book that objectivists will find curious and controversial is that he validates regular causal action between entities very late in the book, uh, the, uh, way later than the seven items that I listed in that list. And he validates that thesis using a statistical argument. He validates regular causal action between entities using a statistical argument. Now, I'm still skeptical of Ron's overall approach, but what you will find is that Ron has answers to the standard objections that an objectivist would raise. So it's worth giving a lot of careful thought to what Ron raises in his book. Now, my primary interest in this book is that it constitutes a work of philosophy written in what I would call an inductive order instead of a, the, an order of a conditional hierarchy, which I believe to be the order of OPAR. We only have audio for this interview, but the video will show a written form of the questions that uh, Ron is answering to help you follow the conversation. And if you'd like to buy his book, uh, you can find Ron's book on Amazon, and I provided a link to it in the description. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Ron Pizzaturo. Basically, what I found to be the most challenging part of your book was um, the beginning. And it was... That's interesting. Yeah. Am I the first person who said that? <laughs> yeah. Huh. Interesting. That is interesting. But, but, but there are not that many people who've read it, so, you know. <laughs> I see. Yeah, I, I, I remember, uh, well, Arshak had, I remember in the in the, inter the other interview you did with Arshak, he seemed to be right on board, like, very easily with the idea of what a logical order is versus a chronological order versus whatever the OPAR hierarchy is. And that, to me, is... Uh, a huge sticking point. I, there's, there, it seems like there's just a lot there that I don't understand, and it's, okay. and it seems like what part of what motivated your validation of knowledge is a similar. It seems to me that it was. Sur, it, it seems to me there's a lot of commonalities between us, between my thinking about what the OPAR order represents and what. And what motivated you to do this book? So we'll we'll see if you if we, we'll see if those commonalities are 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 actual commonalities. So so, okay. so first, coming from that perspective, here's uh, one of my here's my first question, and it's a skeptical question about the way you order the book um, that comes from the OPAR perspective. This isn't really my perspective. This is kind of like I would imagine most objectivist asking this question uh okay. here, yeah here's the question uh they'd they'd ask 
isn't the justification for regular causal action, isn't that just the law of identity and not some kind of probabilistic argument from experience or, or really any specific argument, basically? Because we already know from observation, as soon as we open our eyes, that things are what they are. Now, doesn't that simply mean as a result that those things will act in accordance with their nature don't isn't that like schematically the validation of causality so to answer your question in a word no yeah um and but i i don't want to speculate about maybe i forget whether we talked about this or someone else about um Ayn Rand's own view through Peacock seemed to be you have to look out at the world, you know, and and see that causality is everywhere. So, so James, this goes back to what I said in our first conversation about there being stages of our understanding of causality. Yeah. Okay, so if we start with our first, now again, I'm saying start with our first, it sounds as though I'm talking about chronology, but I'm, 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 I'm talking about logically. If, we, if we're starting over, you know, and trying to see or grasp what we know um, that we can use as a theoretical base, you know, when we look out at the world and we are, in that way we are certain of only two things that out there and ourself and to that extent we can assign identity to each of those two things. There's this whole world and then there's myself. And those, each of those has identity. But when we use the law of identity or the law and the law of causality in real life, so to speak, well, not only so to speak, but literally, we need more than that, right? We need to know that this thing has, you know, is its identity, and this thing is its identity, right? Now, from starting with our first with the first experience that we're going to examine philosophically to use as our base we cannot know that yet just by looking out at the world even if these two things are in our field of vision if we're starting from scratch with what we know and trying to build our knowledge one step at a time, we don't yet know that this thing is going to continue acting in a certain way all the time, or even that it's going to continue acting in a certain way the next time, or what it even means to be acting in a certain way, except that we're aware of it right now. And the same thing with this other thing, you know? So if I, if I start with, again, with this example of one thing holding up another sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I don't know that this is, this roller object is always going to be able to hold up this other object. That, that would be crazy to think that if we're just starting with our base of knowledge we have to we have to establish that 
And that, that takes a, a process of induction, right? Yeah. So again, so again, there are stages. There's the first stage of the whole world is out there, and I'm aware of it. And so there are these two things that have their identity. Then there's recognizing that, oh, look at this. I'm moving this around, and somehow it's it's got some kind of integrity to it in contrast to the background. And my feeling of it also has an integrity to it. And there's also a consistency between those two integrities, the tactile integrity and the uh, visual integrity. Wow, it's acting in the same way on my awareness over time, right? But I don't know that that means that it's going to have a certain constant mass and it's going to always act with this other thing in a certain way that, that that's something that still has to be established and if we were to go to the chronological question it would be something that a, a you know an infant would have to discover right even if we went to the, the, the issue of implicit knowledge, and you can say that even the infant has some kind of implicit knowledge of existence, and, um, and he, you know, he sees different objects, but he experiments, right, before he knows, oh, this thing has some kind of uh, continuity to it. And the continuity to it is another way of saying that it has, you know, it, 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 it it has its identity and it's going to act in a certain way so so that's why my answer to your question is no um there are steps yeah there's the step of, of knowing existence and consciousness then there's the step of knowing that there are exi- that specific disparate entities exist and then there's the probabilistic argument that these entities are going to continue to exist and interact with each other in a predictable way based on our evidence and our data that they have acted in that way many times in the past. Right. I mean, I guess there's, there's another way of, if I, if, you know, I'm just looking out at the world, or even an infant. He doesn't know that this thing is going to keep its integrity or identity in the next moment. It could, you know, explode or something. And when he's first looking out at the world, before he even grasps entities, how does he know there are entities? He sees a, you know, maybe a, as they say, a whirling buzz. It, 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 um, it's an achievement to, you know, see oh, there's something. Uh, unchanging about this world, whirring buzz, right? Hmm. Now, whether or not that those are the chronological steps, those those are the logical steps I took. The first, we're just going to start with what we know. We see something out there. Now, let's build on that. Oh, we see some kind of consistency with those things out there. Now we're going to, and we're going to call that those things entities, and uh, and then we're going to see that they remain entities, and they not only are they uh, unchanging in how we see them and perceive them, but they're unchanging with how they interact with each other, and then we give a name to that principle, which we call the law of identity. Hmm. Yeah. So, so the, the, I have a separate, I have a separate set of questions about the probabilistic arguments themselves, specifically, specifically whether it's really true that the entity before you could explode at every, at any second, you know, provided and I, I realize you're talking. You're not. You're not speaking from an adult context of knowledge there, because as adults, obviously, it is absurd that it would blow up. 
But you, I understand that you're specifically trying to say, well, the reason you know it won't blow up is exactly because of the argument I'm giving. So, That's right, because yeah. you, you've seen it not blow up for so long. <laughs> that's, yeah, right. That's why. Yeah, and well, and then an adult knows the causes of blowing up also, so and you know that that right. doesn't have those properties, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But like, even even when you're, you know, a five year old, you'd find it absurd that something could simply explode at any moment without warning. Well, sure, because yeah. you've already had so much information. <laughs> it, exactly. Imagine if you would took a kid sadistically and put him in a room where his only. Uh, sensory stimulus was a movie screen uh, that showed things that are all blowing up all the time. Mm. You know, like a like a contemporary movie. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, it wouldn't be that hard to find right? the required footage. Yeah. yeah. So what, what would he, he gather from that? Right. Okay. So, okay. so that, huh. that's all to say that we know these things from experience. Yeah, we also know that children who are raised in a uh, unpredictable environment do actually have their ability to reason compromised, and I wonder if it's because their one their their n over n plus one experiences are actually insane. Like it, it they've they've literally grown up with unpredictable seem from and from their context of knowledge insane uh experiences it's not actually insane like we can look at the, you know the abuse and we understand some of the causes free will you know you know b- bad choices on the parents parts etc but like to them it's it's uh, very hard to end up with some of these basic laws okay huh I wasn't even going to go there, but that's a pretty. I'll, I'll have to think about. I was going to say that I was going to. I was going to raise these objections during our next conversation, but that's something for me to think about until then. That that's just a very okay. direct. Yeah, I mean, just to just to throw another. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I have it all written down, so you can I throw mean, another thing. Imagine in. a primitive man who starts having dreams. Hmm. And. How, how does he know? Let's say he's someone. Some people dream, as I've heard, they have very um, realistic-looking dreams. Let's say, and how does how does he know they're a dream and not that things really do blow up or whatever happened in the dream and uh, this thing morphs into this thing and right. Or an animal morphs into a human, and, and, and all these things happen. And um, I, when kids have dreams like that early on, and, you know, and the, the parents say, well, no, it was just a dream. It's not, didn't really happen, right? Yeah. And they're drawing on millennia of experience with dreams. Their parents told them what a dream was, and their parents told them what a dream was, and their et cetera, et cetera. Like we just, and that does, but without without that heritage, without that guidance, it would you know you you you'd probably figure it out on your own, but it would definitely be harder, and then you also might not figure it out on your own. If uh, yeah, I mean that's how some religions are born, right? I was about to say that this might be the cause of, like, the psychological cause of being a shaman. Like, it always kind of yeah. concerned me, like, where did and they and get the this BS? Get a boost from a bidet, which ruler uh, had a dream, and it came true, and then he thought, oh, you know. Yeah. The Christ- Christianity is right, but somehow, you know. So, um, you know, and, and even... The, the adults in the room from experience, how did they learn it? Well, they, they learn it, I think, I mean, I'm not an expert in this area, but it, from continuity, right? Yeah. You know, you, you dream that uh, something happened to a loved one, that, it, that the loved one was killed, and you wake up, and then you go into the, the next room, and you see the person's still there, and it's okay, right? 
and uh, the, the, the dreams have these discontinuities, but there's a, con- there's a continuous thread in the waking hours, and they come to realize, well, that's the real stuff, because that's the part that's continuous. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> I never even thought of any of that that way. Cool. Yeah. Huh. All right. Well, that's that's something for me to chew on as I um, reconsider my objections to those statistical arguments. But before before I raise any of those objections, and now maybe I won't even raise those objections after after yeah, I think about know, it. More. Let me raise something about the statistical things also. Sure. Yeah, maybe yeah. To anticipate some problems that certain people will have with that. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to say that in a meaning for like certain people. I mean, you know, a, a, a legitimate question that someone might raise about that is, well, if things are probabilistic, don't you get into an infinite regress? So it's probable that it's probable that it's probable. And if, if there's no certainty, then where, where are you? Um, even your probability has no anchor. And I think that there's a, there's a legitimate basis to that question. And... In, in my epistemology, I do have to have anchors that are certain, right? And then from there, I can have probabilities. Yes. So you, you need both, basically. Yes. I'm definitely on board with that part. Um, so yeah, that, but, but I'm not sure if I'm on board with the probability, but I'll, okay. you know, yeah, I'll keep thinking about it, basically. Um, yeah, well, that's all, all, all the way in chapter eight and nine. So yeah, we have a, we have a ways to go to get to get there. Yeah. So before and before I get there, in my understanding of your book, I definitely have to be convinced of um, your view of logical order. And so all the questions I wrote down today were to to get clear on that because i think okay 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 so i'll just actually i'll just move on to the second question here so here's another here's another question from the opar perspective now incidentally i'm not 100 percent sure if my first question is really from the opar perspective but like but maybe it is like i could i could definitely see some objectivists asking it I suspect, <laughs> I suspect, Peacock would have something. Some of I would guess Peacock would object to saying that that last question was from his perspective. He would say that's not the. He, I'm guessing he would not. He would he would say that he would word it differently or he would reject the question. I'm guessing, but it's still yeah, a question yeah, worth yeah, noting. Yeah, you don't, don't want to put words in someone else's mouth. Yeah. So, so I just take the question as coming from you. And, it's coming and, from my yeah, understanding. From, from your perspective of uh, your understanding of how someone might understand OPAR or your yeah. understanding of it or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> it should just be understood that anything I say is what I think is good. <laughs> it's like, I don't know. Right. I, you get really tangled up with these statements sometimes anyway yeah so here's here's a here's another here's another skeptical question um okay. from this sort of from from the perspective that from from the opar perspective so isn't it the case that identity is present from the outset just from your awareness of existence and you put identity relatively far down the list um so it but isn't it the case that identity is is present just from the outset so even to use your language i'll I'll elaborate on the question here to even to use the kind of imagery that you uh or, or to use the kinds of descriptions you used in the book I'm looking out on the wor- out at the world. I'm looking at it like you said, the way a painter would look at it all. And here's some green. Here's some blue. Here's a sm- you know, the green is green. 
the blue is blue. It is what it is. So is an identity yeah. just right there, just to begin with? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a good question too. Um, and if I recall, I wrote in the book we could we could we could develop these things in different orders to make okay. be. And I I'm choosing to start with existence and consciousness. Okay. But yeah, I could have I could have gone right to identity. Got it. Um, so you know when you when you're when you're writing and you're going in. See, you know, a book, you don't, you don't branch in the book, right? A, a book, you, mm-hmm. you take one yeah. order. Yes, And you yes. take one possible order. So if you happen to have a tree structure, um, you pick one branch of the tree, mm-hmm. and you go as far as you want to there, and then you, you know, you might go down another, another branch of the tree. And as long as each thing you're doing is, is logically justified, that's okay. There's, there's there's more than one way to do it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that would be my 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 answer to that. And, and um, I, maybe another thing you're asking about is I got to identity with a few steps as well um, that I had um, uh, multiplicity, mm-hmm. right? And from multiplicity when you have more than one thing, well then that's why I'm motivated to even to come up with the concept of identity, right? Because if you have just one thing, right. what does it yeah. get you to formulate a concept of identity? Yeah, right, well, yeah. It, it, it only has a, has a payoff if there's more than one thing, right? And, and, and each one of those things not only is different, but acts differently and, you know, has different characteristics and, and, and so forth. So, um, I, I, don't, I, I don't think my treating identity like a few pages later, as I did, I think it was just a few pages, undercuts the validity, you know, of identity or the validity of what I covered before, mm-hmm. there's some you know there's some options involved, but also what I was trying to do there was to introduce a concept only when it had already been motivated. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm very big on that in my physics inductions. Well, I'm more than <laughs> saying I'm big on it is. Uh, completely the wrong way to put it. I think it's a nece- I actually think it's a necessary part of inductive logic to motivate uh, a given idea before uh, before presenting. I think motivation is part of the evidence uh, yeah. effectively. Yeah. And the same thing with even with axioms and philosophy, you know, um, even if you say, yeah, okay, it's true. I, I, I understand there's this axiom of existence. What, why are you bringing that up? Yeah. Why, why are you bringing up identity? What, so that, you know, uh, I, I used a few pages before that to motivate it. Yeah. And in, this, is, this is a bit of a sidetrack, but I think it's worth saying this just about mo- uh, like the issue of motivation. When I was... I forget, like, I think five or five years old or so, I was sitting on my bed and the thought just occurred to me, if I chose to, I could just keep sitting here and never move ever again. (laughs) It just, it just kind of occurred to me. And I said, and then I said, okay, I'm not going to do that. Why am I not going to do that? And I said, well, because um, I can only have fun if I like actually move so you so from if if you interpreted this generously then you'd say you might say i became an egoist at this moment and i totally did (laughs) it took i had to read ayn rand to become an egoist i was not an egoist before um and the reason was is because this thought of mine emerged in it did not emerge in a motivational context of 
why should I act? It was more just along the lines of like, why will I act is almost kind of the context. I wasn't trying to identify, you know, I wasn't, the specific reason I was asking this question is not because I was trying to identify, you know, the proper, uh, you know, justification for action, even though I got the answer, like why do anything? And from a little kid's perspective, the right answer is to have fun, right? We, we end up becoming more refined later, but for a kid, that's basically, uh, you know, the evidence he's going to get. But so, so like, this is an example where, yeah, like that, that I use to demonstrate that motivation, um, makes a huge difference in the actual content of what ends up getting proven. So, okay, anyway. Um, okay, great. So I'm going to move on. What does, what exactly does logical order mean? Um, y- yeah, give me in your own words what logical order means. You did already say this in the book. Yeah. yeah well, these are these are all thoughtful questions, James. Thanks. And uh, I, I took logical order to mean in order uh, in an order such that each new identification, you know, each each subsequent uh, statement of knowledge um, can be considered true mm-hmm. yeah. based on itself as evidence and also based on what I already know. Right. Okay. That is in 100% agreement with my own view of what logical order is. I think so, and but I think we end up diverging. I think we'll find out. Well, what, what, would, be, what would be your own words? Maybe your words are better. From what we've said so far, I'm just in full agreement with what you just said. Uh, I just prefer your okay. wording right right now. <laughs> I could I could t- I could show you my wording from my paper, but it's not worth the time. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, okay. And just, yeah. you know, just to um, I hope not to belabor the point, but sometimes you can introduce a new piece of information that is self-evident, but it's now something you want to introduce because it's motive because it's motivated, right? And you're going to use it for the next step. Yes. Well, my yeah, I completely agree, but I actually think of it a little bit I think of it differently and I think not a little bit differently I think this ends up being importantly different I consider Uh the motivation to be one of the steps along the logical order so yeah. yeah so as a result if you lack the motivation for a particular premise so for example i certainly lacked the motivation for an ethics because i was freaking five i lacked the knowledge required to see that a broad ethical view was valuable so i lacked the motivation not due to laziness but due to ignorance if you don't know treasure is buried right under your feet you won't be motivated to dig (laughs) is the idea so um so I consider the motivation to actually be one of the stages of the logical order because I think of of values, uh, I think of value identifications as a kind of knowledge and it's a kind of knowledge that's in the logical order and um, and that's all I'll say actually. And the, and the reason I think this is because the, the reason, the, the way I found this out is because when trying to put physics in its logical order, when, uh, when trying to put physics in a logical order, not a chronological order, but a logical order, I found that the, the, oh man, 
the the story didn't this is not a good way to put it but this is the the story didn't seem to make sense if you didn't include the motivation because what ended up happening is is just suddenly um copernicus is just suddenly asking a certain question and then he discovers it or like here's here's one of my favorite examples suddenly uh, louis de broglie says hey dude like i wonder if matter is a wave too like it's, and there's no way he just like smoked weed one day and said like dude like what if it matters a wave and then they check it and yes matter has a wave type property They're like no there was a specific reason he thought that there was a specific thing he was trying to figure out and this store there was a specific thing he was trying to figure out and getting that background what i found always requires you to specifically understand the values that the scientists were trying to achieve using their questions and then further this just led me to just kind of a broader understanding of the fact that this this I'm just i this just led me to an integration which is just simply that any cognition that isn't motivated is unethical um, not like you're not unethical in the way other people say it but it's it's not egoistic why are you wasting your time on some random you know investigation there's like all 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 human a all valid human action is motivated and that includes epistemology so yeah no, I, I, I agree with you. I, I like that identification. You're not saying that lacking that motivation makes the science un, un, immoral, but it's amoral. I, um, it depends. N not immoral as, the, as in you're hurting others, but you're... I would just say you're, uh, you could direct, I would just simply say to a person, like, you could direct your life a little more, or maybe a lot more, if you're, yeah. and, well, <laughs> and the thing is, this is actually a really big deal, ethically. Um, not for me, but for um, a lot of other intellectuals, really. I notice that they're, they're in academia, and they're wasting their time on a bunch of BS and they don't, they don't even understand the value of what they're doing. A lot of times it's because there really is no value to what they're doing, but they don't ask the question, like why, why is this question worth asking? And it ends up boiling down to other academics thinks it's, other academics think it's important, um, ends up being the, que ends up being the answer to that. And that's obviously not valid scientific motivation. So. Uh, so and, so and do, you, do, you, do you actually find that that attitude among many academics? Absolutely. That's too bad. Yeah. Well, I mean, I I would say I don't find the attitude. I find every once in a while I find people who are cynical and they they just say I don't know why the hell I'm doing this. Like I was, my 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 PI told me I had to do it. That's and and they're kind of cynical about it. But even if you. But then even those who are happy with what they're doing, you ask them what the point is and they don't have an answer. They don't have a straight answer. They say a bunch of words and they don't make any sense to me and I'm not convinced it constitutes some kind of actual answer that guides them in their lives. Um, so I think, this is, um, I think this is actually a really big problem in academia right now. Well, you, what you're saying makes good sense. Well, thank you. <laughs> I, I could just throw something else at, uh, yeah. out of, about that. Um, I bet that you you don't have to memorize the whole proof, right? When you when you have the attitude you're espousing, you can get plunked down, so to speak, at any page of the you know thousand page book of proofs of physics and just by knowing where you are at that step and the motivation, you can recall the next step. Yes, it definitely helps with that as well. Um, yeah, and there's okay. there's a lot more to that, but let's. Um, but okay. I'll, I'll I'll make sure we get back to um, this line. So okay, so logical order. Yeah. Um, okay. Great. So. And so there's there's multiple uh, 
no, let's just move on to the next question. Okay. Okay. Uh, what? What does implicit knowledge mean to you? What does implicit knowledge? That's. It just struck me. It's funny that we're talking about philosophical concepts this way. You know, most people would think of they would ask questions like, "What does I love you mean to you?" And mm. we're talking about what does implicit. Anyway. <laughs> um, uh, and let me give the motivation for this question because uh, yeah. on its own it it's not just the question on its own isn't enough so the reason is is because um, uh, um, it's opar is supposed to be written in a logical order that's that's what Peikoff says Peikoff says it's in a logical order and by logical order I think he agrees with both of us. Like it, it's the order in which it can be validated. The, the ideas can be validated. It, it's a order in which they can be validated. And Peikoff, part of what Peikoff makes reference to in order that that's a feature of his logical order is that he's talking about implicit knowledge. Because obviously the child doesn't have the concept of existence when he opens his eyes. But he has the units which could be integrated into that concept. So he has the implicit concept of existence, identity, consciousness. So um, do you have, I guess I would ask, do you have a, a, a differing view of what implicit knowledge is that led you to your particular validation as opposed to OPAR's? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if I'm satisfied with my question, but let's well, just do that. Yeah, that's okay. It's good because it's a good enough question for another, yeah. another interesting question. I was motivated to develop the order that I eventually did by the intention of not having to rely on implicit knowledge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I really like that, by the way, and I'll talk about why I like that later, okay. but go on. Yeah, yeah. This is, this is so, why, uh, this is probably, this is the biggest, the, the fact that like you wanted to explicit, give an explicit validation for knowledge as opposed to an implicit one. That's why I'm spending so much time with your book, basically, is because, and I think that speaks for itself, actually. So go on, yeah, because you can, because okay. you agree, you agree. I'm I'm right on board with you on this point, anyway. That um, I want I want the actual validation, not not like an argument about like the order of implicit knowledge, um, right. and I'll talk about why right. I don't like implicit knowledge later. So yeah. Right. So, so, you know, the standard objectivist meaning of implicit knowledge is something I accept, but I don't have to rely on it mm. because I don't rely on implicit knowledge. Mm -hmm. I, I think that using implicit knowledge as part of the validation is a kind of conflating it's a conflation of logical and chronological, mm. right? Mm. I'm going to write so, that down. You know, it, it, it's one thing. Now, I don't, I don't want to say categorically that that's what Peacock or Ayn Rand did, because they might have been just saying, look, I'm going to throw in some statements about what is... Um, uh, what, what happened to be chronological too but to my mind when I did my validation with the standards of rigor that I set I did not want to mix those two even in the presentation and I wanted the validation to be strictly explicit knowledge Cool. So, uh, so that actually takes us right to question three, 
It sounds like your okay. answer is. It sounds like your answer to question three is just yes. Um, but let's make sure I'm I'm thinking about it right. Would you okay. say that part of the motivation for this book was to state the hierarchical? Uh, I don't like hierarchical. Let's say logically ordered validation of our knowledge in explicit form yeah. instead of OPAR's implicit form. So that's I mean that's basically what you just said. Well, you know, so I, I don't think when I set out to do this that this this avoidance or excision of, of the implicit part was like the main motivation. Yeah. But it was it was in there. Yeah. You know? It it was it was subsumed under the idea of I want this to be rigorous. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Right, that's why I just I said it's part part of the motivation. I I, I figured okay. it wasn't the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Right. Right. Good. Great. Okay. Number four. Now, would you agree with the following statement? We should not build hierarchies of implicit knowledge, since one cannot reason with implicit knowledge. I don't know why I asked the question this way, but basically. This, this is something I, th I don't know, <laughs> this is something I think. I, I think um, uh, a logical order that makes reference to implicit knowledge is, um, it's not necessarily wrong, actually, but in order to be sure that it was right, we would have to understand things about implicit knowledge that we don't right now. Because I think you can reason from certain kinds of implicit knowledge in certain kinds of ways and then you can't reason from other kinds of implicit knowledge at all and so any any concept held implicitly can only kind of in some cases be used as prior knowledge that gets you somewhere else that gets you to some next phase but in but if you make everything explicit you just don't have to worry about this you yeah. just don't have to worry about any of this at all. Um, That's right. Yeah. So I, 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 I agree with you. So, you know, I, I'm usually reluctant to say, oh, something cannot be done this other way. And I think that's kind of what you said just now. But it's, it's not the way I'm going to choose to do it because I, this way I'm choosing to do it is, uh, you know, is, is a way that, that, uh, you, I, I can I, I can validate. I mean, if someone else wants to try to do it another way, let them try. Um, but uh, I don't know whether that's going to work out. Yeah. It, you know, it just occurred to me as you were describing this that you know one motivation that philosophers might have had, and possibly even objectivist philosophers had, in introducing this concept of implicit knowledge was an answer to skeptics who say, how could we even have gotten this far to know anything? You know, these arch skeptics that we, we really can't know anything because if we, if we, to know this, we had to know this, and to know that, we had to know this, and it, it, there's no way to, you know, to, to come up with an order that was possible. So. We're, we're um, you know, uh, we, we can't know any, know anything, um, and, and possibly thinkers brought up this idea of implicit knowledge to say, well, no, this is how it could have happened. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But I, I don't find it necessary to answer a skeptic like that because. Um, it doesn't matter, but we're here now, and I'm going to build the, 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 the hierarchy of knowledge right now. And you're telling me we couldn't have gotten to the state we're in? Well, guess what? We are in the state, you know? I mean, instead of answering Parmenides by saying, well, let me see the flaw in his argument. So look, now that we are here, we do see things change, mm. right? So um, there's... Uh, I think I think in the end, there's there's not a need to come up with some kind of plausible order to justify that we can even know anything. 
because we do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we are aware of the world, and we're here, and we do have language, right? And we, so, um, uh, I, I, I don't, I don't devote any any energy to that. Yeah, to that um, to that need. Yeah, and I think I think another another thing that a lot of those skeptical questions get wrong is that they are the, I think I think there's a way to just show that they're I mean, first of all, yeah, like just just ignoring them and 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 revalidating it is is the most productive course of action there. Yeah. Um <laughs> But I would say something can be gained from a partic- noticing something that they do wrong, which is they're reversing logical order. They're, they're reversing logical order in even asking the question. And of course, this is a common objectivist point. I don't want to imply that the only motivation for having come up with this um, you know, implicit knowledge idea is to answer skeptics. Because yes. As I mentioned before, it, it, it's a it's a valid question to say. Well, how in the world did we get to where we are now? You know, and if I if I do just a logical presentation, um, it's kind of mysterious. Gee, how did how did we? It seems like a bootstrapping, right? Like a literal bootstrapping. How how did we do it? And then you know, this is a, a good answer to that. But this is the way. These are the steps, and we we did. You know, I don't have to re- rehearse everything we already said, and and so there's knowledge to be gained by thinking about this idea of implicit knowledge. It's just not the the focus or the need for for my purpose. Yeah, yeah. And cool. My purpose in this book. Right, so. the validation of knowledge. Yeah, or a mm-hmm. a validation because yeah. you're you've said that there's probably other possible orders um cool okay so uh number four um how would you differentiate the logical order in your book from the logical order in my inductive summary of physics now i know you haven't watched that much of it uh, I, I, st- I'm, I started the second uh, the second uh, chapter. Oh well, then you've you've pretty much watched enough. Then you've seen you've oh. seen yeah. Well, in order to understand this question, because you've seen oh, okay. an entire two hours of what I call logical inductive order. Um. So now, okay. So I so ha- so what's what's the similarities and differences between your logical order in a validation of knowledge and the way I order things in the inductive summary of physics. What are some similarities and differences? Oh. Just thinking off the top of my head, uh, I see the similarity in you, you want to motivate each idea and we're all taking a logical order. Of course, there is going to be similarity between most lo- most logical orders and chronological. But you you um, give primacy, it seems, to the lo- to the logical order. So that's a similarity. You you ground things and in facts. You, you don't bring things in out of the blue. You, um, you, 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 you bring new ideas in and validate them as you go. So, uh, so far, I, I, I don't see anything different. I see, I see those similarities. Um, it's it's a it's of course a very different subject, and maybe if I thought about that question, it's another interesting question. I probably should revisit that question after I watch the whole the whole series. You know, well, I'm not seeing any contradiction between your approach and mine. 
Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I don't think there's a contradiction. The The question was more along the lines of, like, are these two different senses of logical order? And, oh, and I, I, I think... I didn't get that. I didn't see a different sense. I, I think I do, because... Here's what I think that I mean. Here's here's one big difference. At least here's one big difference. Um, uh, my sense of logical inductive order, at least as it pertains to physics, I haven't tried an induction of philosophy. Um, actually, I did try, and I decided it was too hard. Um, I, I just couldn't figure out how to get started. Um, um, my sense of a logical inductive order is that it is a possible chronology. But I'm picking a oh, chronology. Okay. Like, it's, it's, it's a order people could have discovered it in. It's maybe a little implausible because I cut out all the mistakes and all the superstition and all of the wrong turns... So, and, and it all happens very quickly and conveniently, so it's perhaps an implausible order, but it's a possible chronological yeah, okay. order. I see that. And yeah. that's an actual requirement for what I consider to be logical order. Now, you um, may have a different sense of logical order from that. Um, that's also valid, but I wanted to just flesh out that differentiation between what yeah, I'm doing and yours. So, yeah. So let me, let me, let me try to make a, a, little, a little more similar, though. Mm. In, in, in this regard, my first two chapters of the book, especially that second chapter, is like um, your, your approach for all of physics. Like mm. I did a very quick cycle through what the human, you know, Western civilization did go through and just thinking about it off, off the top of my head, had to go through even to begin to be philosophers, right? So even, even to get to the step, so here's, a, here's one difference I think between physics and philosophy. To some, to some extent, is that even to go to get to the stage of being a philosopher requires, you know, many millennia of intellectual development, right? This is why I couldn't apply my method to philosophy. I couldn't figure out how basically a caveman would become a phil philosopher. Yeah. And maybe one day someone will figure that out, but I just decided to do something easier, basically. Well, but that, but that's the whole point. You, you, there, were so, there would be so many steps, and that's, a, that's an interesting pursuit. And as we know now, we could say, to get back to your other question, that every caveman implicitly has a philosophy, right? But to get yeah. to the stage, right? But to get to the stage of having an explicit philosophy, even conceiving of the subject of philosophy, is a highly advanced, you know, um, uh, <clears throat> development. Now, you know, you could, might you might say a similar thing with physics. Um, so what would we say historically? I mean, the first philosophers thought to have been Thales. Mm -hmm. Do you cover phys people who thought about physicist-type physicist questions in astronomy or whatever that predate Thales? Yes. Uh, yeah. Because I'm on... Yeah, basically. And you saw those inductions, which is the induction that the sun is the cause of the seasons so that would be yeah. something that would have come before Thales and then a few okay. others yeah and actually yeah. in one version of the story um th uh like the lunar eclipse is discovered by Thales when he's a boy 
<laughs> but I decided that was too confusing, so I changed okay. the story. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so even Thales was a physicist before he was a philosopher. Yeah. But it, but it, but it, it, yeah. So, so that's why the, the subjects lend themselves in different degrees to uh, that kind of, you know, um, detailed chronology. But I think I do give some kind of chronology that's a motivation in that second chapter mm. about how humans try to find starting points. And, mm-hmm. you know, first starting point is, um, or an early kind of starting point is a temporal starting point, right? This cause, this, this cause, you know, this God made the river go, but that God has a parent who made everything happen, uh-huh. you know. And you go back to, you know, a primitive version of a prime mover. They're mm-hmm. looking for some chronological causal chain, right? And the starting point is the thing, the first thing that happened. And, uh, you know, or the first God. And, that, and you know, you have stories like that, Genesis, right? There's things that, that happen in that kind of order. And then you had something like Thales who had, um, what's, the, what's the most basic kind of material? Right? It's a different kind of starting point. So this, this is a chronological development. Then there was, you know, the idea of in physics that well, even if we don't know what the underlying material is, we can learn a lot about the world just by knowing that each thing has a certain kind of nature right now. You know, and without a, a chronology involved. Right, and so that's a big breakthrough. We don't have to know how. We don't need a cosmology to have uh, a physics. But we don't need to know how we got here. We don't need to know whether there was a big bang or this or that. That's useful, maybe. But just knowing what things are right now can tell us a lot. Just studying how things are acting now. So right. That's enough. And then, and, bef- and just to, at some point, uh, got the idea of what's the starting point of our knowledge, and that's where epistemology begins. And that's a, a very, very advanced concept. So I did like a very quick, you know, develop uh, chronology of human development to get to the point of, gee, we need to find the starting point of our knowledge. But now we're at an explicit level, explicitly. So to speak, and or literally, and so now let's let's start over, and let's go by what we know and, and use use this kind of logical word. So it's so it's like redeveloping the science after we've already learned a lot, but now let's put it in some kind of. Um, new logical order that makes the validation even more clear. And I see you're thinking about that. So let me throw in another example. So in my math papers, which I know you've read, which is also a chapter in the book, I elongate that chronology that's, I guess, closer to the way you develop things. Yes. I do thought experiments on how cavemen might have come up with counting a number, you know, and so forth, and then toward the end of, I think, the first half of the whole chapter in math, I come up with one equals one Mm -hmm. as an axiom. Mm -hmm. Now, if I were just going to do a logical order of math, I could throw away everything I've done up until then. And that would be throwing away the analog of what what you do in physics. Uh-huh. And I could say, now that we know one equals one, let's build math logically from that. Huh. As more advanced people, and it would, it would be a valid, um, uh, you know, logical structure. But it would lose the, the, the motivation. Like, how, how I mean, it would lose the, get to that? Wouldn't it lose the, I mean, it would lose the proof. In, in my view, it loses that like you're basically talking about a kind of like Euclid's elements type system where you'd start with one equals one and then do, I think Bertrand Russell tried to do this, right? I've heard bad things about that attempt. Um, 
from people it that I trust. A, it would not be a symbol. It wouldn't be the symbols one equals one. Mm-hmm. That's what people would often think if they just okay, uh, right? Yeah, symbols, Bertrand. So that, he was way off. Formalism. Yeah, it's more. And it's more. What it means literally is that each one equals each other one. Each thing, mm-hmm. each penny in my in my purse equals each other penny. Yeah, and then I can count the money. Yeah. Each inch is equal to each other inch, and then I can measure the length of things and do math on. Yeah, that's what the one equals one. So I would have to explain what it meant, and I could, I could give like a little spiel on it, you know, a page or two. Yes, and that yes. would be my starting point, and, and then I could develop the rest of the map. But it, it 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 would lose its pedagogic value, I think, because. It's not uh, like how, how in the world did he come up with that? Mm-hmm. You know, so um, he loses some of its storytelling appeal. But but if I'm just doing like a dry, strict proof, yeah, I, I think it would hold up. You know, so um, now that you know to think about how our approaches were different is your. You took that first, you, you did the analog of what I did in the first half of math, that math chapter, or math paper, and you turned it into 20 lectures, which is very, which is great. You know, when you had more than thought experiments to go with, you had a lot of history to draw on, but then you, you, I haven't watched them all yet, but it sounds like you're improving on the history, which is, which is yes. great. In the, in the math paper, I, took what you were whole 20 things and I condensed it into a half of the, of the paper, half of the chapter, and then the other half is, you know, further development. And then in, in this book, I'm, I'm taking all of that motivational history and chronology and condensing it down to one chapter, mm-hmm. 20 pages, and I'm doing now a whole elaborate development. Right. So. So there's, there's certainly a difference in emphasis, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, the math for, you know, other thinkers to, um, to, to study and, um, what's the other word, I, uh, you know, put, put the ideas through the, the grinder and see whether it does hold up and see whether it helps them in their work, and that would be... You know, every philosopher, I think, that's that's the um, the uh, what is it the the holy grail, you know, to see a philosophy actually put into practice. Well, that's and, what and, I and, I intend to do once I'm. Oh, sorry. Put into practice and reap rewards from it. Well, that's what I intend to do once I put it through the grinder. Okay. Yeah. Great. So, um, so I'm glad uh, I'm glad uh, I'm one of the first adopters. <laughs> um, well, I'm not an adopter yet. I'm well, although I'm definitely an adopter of large portions of the book already. Um, definitely your theory of um, I'm kind of focusing. Yeah, this is a little bit negative. Uh, of me because I'm kind of focusing on all my objections, but I have tons of things I just already completely agree with, which were just completely new to me. Uh, so I get I, I'll 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 run those by you real quick just for the sake of uh, just being kind of more positive, but um, and and grateful because it it is really you've noticed in one of my or wait did I send that to you? No, I didn't send that to you yet. But I I in part of these questions I actually used your theory of meaning to help me understand um, um, what um, uh, a point that will come up later. Um, so yeah, your theory of meaning is definitely um, a very important and completely correct. It's, it's boosting off of Ayn Rand's uh, understanding of concepts as measurement omission. And now we know that, uh, forgive me if this is a misformulation, but like that uh, propositions are are have sets of omitted measurements that are they're basically the same thing as concepts, but they're 
they they're they're a mental unit just like a concept but they can only be put together by with a lot of concepts but they can still be treated as a unit with uh omitted measurements is that is that right so uh you know it's funny i, I haven't thought about it that way but i guess it can be but uh, the, 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 the 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 important thing is how do they relate to concepts right mm. The, the way I would view, view it is, uh, is um, they, they are narrower than concepts in two crucial respects, right? The one way that the subject narrows the group of units that is being considered, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you say man, you mean all men. But if you say the man or the men who are in, you know, who grew up in Utah from 1950 to 1960, now you've, you've narrowed the group of units that you're, that, if that's the subject of your sentence, you've narrowed the group of units. And then the predicate, what it does is it takes the whole, it, it goes to the file folder of, of characteristics of the subject and it, it, it it makes one identification that is part of the whole file folder and yes. calls your attention to that one thing. So it's narrower in that way. So it's narrower both in existence, because the subject calls your attention to the existence of certain things, a narrower group than you know, the subject word, and then it focuses on one item in the file folder for that conceptual grouping. Mm. Yeah. That's how it relates to, to, to concepts. And the, the benefit of that is not only that it relates to some, identify something more specific, the way, um, you know, like a caveman again might have used language initially is, you know, give me that, give me that, uh, you know, tool, right? That, that, that acts or whatever. Um, it's, the, the more advanced, civilized purpose of concept, of propositions is to put your conceptual knowledge in a highly specific logical order. That's how we, that's how we put into practice this whole idea of a logical order, right? That's, that's, the, that's the power of propositions. Hmm. Can you so, expand yeah. on that? I'm not making the connection. Yeah. Yeah. So, to, to give an example, imagine some book you love. Take out the shrub. Imagine if the well, that's a fiction. But even there, you know, take take the uh, introduction to objectivist epistemology. Now imagine the book with all the sentences randomly. <laughs> I see. Yes, yes, because it's it's certainly written in a particular logical order, and it's a logical order in exactly the sense we were talking about earlier. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Now it's a logical order. It's not. It's it's what I would call a logical order with a particular starting context. Right. So, yeah. like, it it assumes. It assumes what I call the dentist context, which is it assumes the reader is smart but has no technical knowledge. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, so I call that the sure. dentist context, yeah. yeah. So if you wrote a book about man, and I wrote a book about man, and someone else, if, we, if all the books were right and true and logical, they would all be valid, but we might be focusing on different things. One person might focus on the biological attributes of man, another one might focus on the artistic attributes, and others on the ethical attributes, or some mixture, there, there are, you know, countless books that can be written on a, on a given subject, each one of them could be logically valid, but each one of them has a different cognitive purpose, right, and each one identifies different aspects of an entire purpose of knowledge. Have propositions in the first place. You can't just have a book that just had a bunch of concepts. No one could follow that, <laughs> right? Uh -huh. It's not specific enough. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and and, and, uh, and then, but the other thing is, it's got to be in the right order. 
Mm-hmm. You know, and so this is you know sometimes objectivists. I think I mentioned this last last time. You can get bogged down trying to think of what's the logical order of your concepts. You, it's a it's an unanswerable question. There's some things you could say, but concepts are so broad. Yes. That you putting them in some kind of order is not satisfactory. Yeah. You, you blow the whole idea of having a spiral of knowledge. You know certain things about you know these things, and then you know certain things about this and certain things. You've got to be much more specific than just learning out a concept. Yeah, I mean, you've got to, you've got to identify one thing. You know, if I if I just threw out the concept force, well, what you know, right? And then action, reaction, cause, effect. What the heck are you going to get from that? You you know you you have to say this thing causes this. This thing has. These effects, these things take these actions. You've got to be very specific. I'm not being specific right now, but I'm pointing out you've got to be specific. And then you do broader things. But the only way, the tool we have for that specificity that is needed for logic is propositions. Yeah. And and I think the, the main contribution I made to the to that thing is that it's one thing to say that it's it's the way we can do logic that I explain how it's by it being narrower in these two respects that I just mentioned. Cool. So that's jumping ahead to chapter six or so, but I appreciate you bringing that up. So first I'm going to recapitulate part of your position. Then you can tell me if I'm getting it right. Your process of constructing a logical order of knowledge is to take our adult concepts, or really what I mean is our adult ideas, our adult ideas and arrange them in a way where each concept, each idea is preceded by the ideas required to know that a given idea is true. This is a proper validation, even though it is not a possible chronological order, because now that we have our adult perspective, we can consider the units subsumed by the concept, for example, existence, then consider the units subsumed by the concept part and whole, etc., And in retrospect, see that each of these concepts has a basis in perception, thus validating it. Is that a fair a fair um, uh, account of part of what you're doing? Well, that's pretty good. But apropos of this discussion we just had, I would not couch it in the terms of an order of concepts. Right. right? Yeah, that's why I was kind of correct. It's really, but well, but we can, we can kind of talk about an order. The reason that an order of concepts doesn't make sense is because concepts evolve over time, I think. So the image I have, um, I'm going to take Ayn Rand's uh, image of a, of a file cabinet with file folders, and I'm going to yeah now give us a, a related image to represent logical inductive order. So uh, a man is looking at some things in the world and then he writes them onto a slip of paper and then he opens the filing cabinet and he realizes, oh, there's nowhere for this to go. Oh, okay, and so he opens up a folder. So, you know, oh, that rat is black and white. Oh, well, let's call that a skunk. Okay, open. Okay, and he puts it in. Okay, black and white rat. Okay, there. Or He wouldn't, I'm being, I, this is a little rough, but it's something like that. Then, then he learns about some other animals. He's opening up all sorts of file folders. Then, uh, later, oh, the skunk stinks when it's scared. Okay, put that, in, and now he's opening up the file folder, and he's putting a new piece of paper in there that says the skunk stinks when it's scared so like so the in this case uh the learning about learning about the the stinking uh was uh chronologically dependent on opening up that skunk file folder 
Um, maybe. I, I didn't pick a great story here, but it's something like that. So the idea is, is that like concepts do, I think, appear in a logical order, but like alter, it's really the opening or alteration of concepts that's part of that logical order. So, yeah, so to, to, to build on your analogy, there will be certain concepts or certain files that you start before certain other files. You might start the rap before you start the cat or whatever, right? Um, but at the end, when you've got your, when you want to have a logical order at the end, you say, my logical order is in that, in that file cabinet. And you open the file cabinet. How do you read the logical order? What you do not do is say, okay, let me look at this concept and all the file contents of this. All right, I got those. Now let me look at the next yes. concept that I... Right? Yes, we don't do that. We really, really, really do don't do that. Yeah. You cannot do that. Yeah. The way you have to do it is you've got to take... You have to put in an order every motion that you made First I put, first I built, first I made a file folder for this concept. Then I made a file folder for this concept. Then I took this thing and I put it in the first file folder. Then I took this thing and I put it also in the first file folder. Then I took this thing and put it in the second file folder. Then I thought of this as the third concept and I put the third folder in the thing that's empty. Then I took the next thing and I put it in that third folder. Then you have to, you have to redo that. You have to recapitulate that whole process yeah. in order to have a logical order of knowledge. Yes. Now, that could take for, forever. So you take shortcuts and you say, well, I put a bunch of things in this file folder and I, you know, but you've got to, you cannot rely solely, and, and maybe you know this already, so I'm beating a dead horse. I'm, Maybe everyone listening knows, but I want to emphasize it. You cannot rely solely on this was the order in which I created the concepts. Yeah. The whole purpose of the need for the propositions is you've got to go finer than that. You have to go be more specific than that. You have to show the threading, the, all that stuff, and that's what the propositions do. And that's what a logical order is. And that's what I tried to do in the book. Hmm. Yeah. I, I, this is a story for another time, but I actually worked under someone who was making that error of putting concepts in a logical order. And that's a very interesting story for another time. So let's move on to question five. Your book takes our, some of our adult ideas and then arranges those ideas in an order, in a logical order, in an order that where each stage lays the foundation, lays the validation for the next. But it's not a possible chronological order. It's not, it's not like my inductions. It's not a possible chronological order. It's a re, it's, it's a presentation of what we have as adults, but presented in a particular new order. And my question is, is it still a logical order if it's not a possible chronological order? And question five is pointing to a real difference between my lectures and your, and the method in your book, um, because it's this, retrospective reordering of the content and that order could is is actually impossible it's it's impossible as a chronology and one yeah. example and one example of that is is you sent this to me in an email you said something along the lines of it takes a long process of inference to identify consciousness 
But once that process of inference is complete, we can, as adults, look back and focus our attention on the sensations, the, the, the mental content which, were, which was available from the beginning about consciousness. Or did I misunderstand your email? Yeah, I think I said that. It's more that I can... Once you see it, you don't you you can't unsee it, right? Once I now I, I, I arrive at it's you know, it's like when you see a you know, you uh you think you might well you're too young to be this, but this thing on my forehead might be cancer, you know. I just I I've never noticed it before, but now now every time you look in the mirror you can't not see it. Mm-hmm. It's there mm-hmm. and you know, it's the first thing you see. Now with, with consciousness it's something similar. Once you are aware of it, you're aware of it directly. Yes. It took it took a, a lot of leading you to see it, but once you see it, you don't need it. You don't need all the hand holding that was needed to get you to see it. Yes. Yes. You know? um, and it, it it actually can turn out to be a firmer base. But everything else that you relied on before, I, I, I thought of like a, um, try this analogy on for size, you know. What if you, what if you suspected that a certain person was a, was a car thief, right? And you had a lot of circumstantial evidence. You know, whenever this car got stolen and then you, you, know, you notice that according to the records of the, the you know the the parking lot this guy paid with his credit card to be in that lot you know he was there for a whole bunch of these car thefts but we don't have any we don't have full proof but we have a lot of circumstantial evidence mm-hmm. right he was in the right place at the right time blah 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 and then you say okay we're going to put a tail on him. We're going to have someone follow him 24 hours a day. And if you do that, and he goes to some remote place where you never would have looked before mm. for this thing, and he goes and steals a car. Mm-hmm. And you have it on video. You have eyewitness. You see it. Now you say, now I know he stole the car. Mm-hmm. So what is your... But you would never have gotten that evidence. If you hadn't had the other... It would never have been perceptually self-evident if you didn't have a bunch of inferences first. No, you never yeah. would have put the tail on him. You never would have followed him 24, you know, 24 hours a day yeah. to this remote neighborhood yeah. to, to do that. So chronologically, you never could have gotten that real damning evidence. But now if you want to prove that the, the car theft that you had circumstantial evidence he really did do you have stronger what's your but you, what's your life you have stronger evidence now of the, of the car theft that you suspected 10 years ago because you see now he's a car thief mm-hmm. so you can how would you how would you establish that this guy is a car thief in your mind would you rely on the 10 year ago evidence First, or the evidence of the, of the video camera and the eyewitnesses seeing him steal this car, I would submit that the that your base evidence, your ground proof evidence, is the latest evidence. Yeah. Even though chronologically you never could have gotten to that with the other. Yes. But you so if you if you were in court and you had to prove that the guy's a car thief. You would go to that case and say, now this is my proof he's a car thief, he did this. Now let me also show you, because I want to keep him in jail for longer, I want to now introduce this other instance, we have all the circumstantial evidence there, plus I'm going to throw into that, we know he's a car thief, Yeah. look at this other way. Yeah. So this later evidence becomes the real strongest basis for knowing that he's a car thief, even in all the other cases, even though that evidence came last 
and with, was not possible without the, the prior evidence. So the prior evidence gave you a lot of information that made you think the guy plausibly is a car, it's, it's a plausible conclusion that he's a car thief. My conclusive evidence is that I got this other thing. And I do something similar in my book. I say that, you know, humans plausibly think that there are these entities and things, you know, every time like a lion, you know, comes out, he's gonna, he, he makes this kind of sound. It, they, they're not scientists. They haven't gone through a rigorous proof, but they have plausible conclusions, right? That this lion is gonna eat me if I hang around, or that the bear is gonna do this or that, or that I won't be able to sneak up on this particular animal. But he doesn't know. He he, well, he knows to a certain degree. But when you and then, so it's like the same way that we have these perceptions of entities. I say we've got this you know pretty plausible case, but we don't have a knockdown drag out proof. And to get that proof, I'm going to now rely on more advanced evidence. You know. And then, which is, has to do with, I, I know causality because this object is acting on my consciousness. Now, I never would have thought of that even as causality until I am very sophisticated. Yep, yeah, right? right. So chronologically, I never got it. But now that I've gotten to it, I think, oh my gosh, this is causality. And here I have knocked down, drag out proof because I'm not just an observer from a distance of two other things acting causally where I'm a third party observing. I'm actually one of the participants in the causal relationship. I'm the receiver of the causal force. I'm, I'm experiencing the effect myself. This is a stronger kind of proof now I can take that and go back to all the other cases and say, I can make a stronger case for the causal effect of these entities on each other because I have experience of causality in this case of this thing acting on me. That's, so, so that's an argument for saying that sometimes relying strictly on chronology is not the strongest case. And, and, and the same, same thing is, is true in your, in your field, and it does not undercut what you're doing, because you can have, you can have all this developed evidence and you know, inferences that, that the um, Greeks made about the heliocentric theory, you know, and the size of the earth and the size of the moon and the sun, which is great. Now, when we have spaceships, right, and you can observe the movement of the heavenly bodies and their speeds and their sizes, now you know more strong, more certainly then the Greeks knew these things, and you can make corrections to them. So if I were to ask you today, how do you know that the Earth revolves around the Sun, that the Earth has this mass and this radius, and the Sun has this radius, and so, and this distance, you would not pull out the proof of Aristarchus, is that his name? Mm -hmm. you, would, you would rely on, on more conclusive knowledge, right? I wouldn't necessarily call it more conclusive, but in this case, I mean, it may be the more, the richer, more detailed knowledge, or perhaps the easier to grasp, like closer to the perceptual level knowledge, is would be two characteristics okay. which make it preferable. Yeah, maybe, maybe so, but I think in some cases you could even say something is more conclusive, like if you you know, a chemist infers that there's germs, but then when you see the germs under a microscope, that's more conclusive, right? It, it depends on whether you are certain in your 
inference before you saw it. Like, for example, I think chemists were certain of the atomic and molecular theory of matter um, before they ever saw atoms and molecules. You, you know what year they finally did see atoms and molecules? Yeah. 2001. Yeah. Yeah. They, could, they, they literally just never had a microscope strong enough to actually see it. And then in some sense, they're not really seeing the atoms and molecules. They're, it's still basically a process of inference, but there's a way to sort of image it in a certain way. But anyway, they couldn't image them at all until 2001, but they were certain of them through a process of inference. Um, so sometimes you can gain certainty with, with inference before you lay eyes on it or, or, or sense it in okay. some way. Yeah. Um, but, and, and all of these examples are analogous to the example in your book, which I think was the, uh, drilling for oil example, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, good. So I'm filing that the same way you are. Cool. Okay. Now, final question. Um, here's an objection to your logical order. Okay. Concepts are not just awareness of certain units. They're awareness of those units through a certain policy of grouping conceptualization. Right. For abstractions from abstractions, that policy of grouping relies on earlier concepts in order to even notice the similarity and difference between the units you're deciding to group. Right. If you mean to make an explicit hierarchy, it seems to me that your hierarchy does not establish the prerequisite abstractions to form the abstractions from abstractions earlier in this hierarchy and some examples of this are part whole consciousness and causality um, perhaps we could gain awareness of the units of these concepts in this order but i don't think we could actually perform the process of measurement omission required to form the concepts as a result this doesn't, it seems like there's a flaw in the logical order. So that's, so now let me be more specific. I'll, so consciousness, for example. Now, chronologically, uh, as you said, we're not aware of consciousness as you know, very early in the process. Whereas in, in your logical order, we become aware of consciousness very early. Um, and it's, and to, to, to concretize my objection in the case of consciousness, I would say in order to, I, consciousness is on the perceptual level. It is on the perceptual level, but in order to differentiate consciousness from the non-conscious, you've got to perform a ton of abstractions from abstraction. You need, it's like abstractions from abstractions from abstractions. Is, it's probably a lot of, I don't, I don't know, but I'm guessing it's a lot of levels. I'm not guessing. I know it's a lot of levels. I'm just not sure what the levels are exactly, but we know that it's got to be a lot of levels. Now, the justification, or rather the validation of the concept of consciousness would therefore uh, rely on all of these abstractions which were required to differentiate uh, consciousness from the non-conscious. And so validation of such a concept would require the validation of all of those other concepts used in the process of abstraction from abstraction. And so in, so, so, so that seems to be a problem with your approach basically is that the abstractions from abstract, you're, you're proving lots of abstractions from abstractions without those earlier abstractions. And so it seems like to achieve this, you'd have to go in a possible chronology, 
not this reconstructed one. Again, these are all that, you know, really excellent questions and, and thought provoking. Um, so, but my answer goes to what I've said before about concepts spiraling, right? Mm -hmm. So even even the even even our now adult sophisticated uh, we have a we have an adult sophisticated concept mm -hmm. of consciousness, but that's not the concept of consciousness that I start with, right? Yeah. So, um, I don't, just, for instance, I don't distinguish at the outset when I deal with something out there and, some, and me. I'm not distinguishing my consciousness from something that's unconscious. I don't know what else is conscious or unconscious. For all I know at that starting point, I might be aware of something that's aware of me. You know, I, I don't know uh -huh. that that thing is not conscious. And at this early stage, I'm really just aware of two things that exist. There's my, yeah. there's me. That at that early stage, I'm not even grouping, putting in a group of conscious things. I don't know that there are other consciousnesses, consciousnesses right? I'm, at that stage, they're more just like, they're close to being proper nouns. They're, they're, they're close to being yes. just um, naming specific entities. It's like a child's conception of mommy and daddy. He doesn't know all, he calls this thing mommy, he doesn't, he doesn't know everyone has a mommy, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He just knows this is this is mommy, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. This is dad, and that's that's all, all by way to illustrate that. What I try to do in the book is when I introduce even these very abstract concepts such as consciousness, I, I try to I try to give a sense, a clear sense of what I mean by that word, that what, what the unit I'm referring to is at that stage. And I'm trying to, um, that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. So, and so you're, you're so, so, validating a file folder, which with much fewer papers in it than my consciousness file for yeah. yeah yeah and, and so it, it, it takes on a different order and so to form the concept the way you might have you know this would be a general answer to form the concepts in the way they might have arrived at um you know uh <clears throat> what was i going to say chronologically typically you need more more instances of it and I might be relying on fewer instances, but because of that as well, I have a more primitive form of the concept. So that's, that's, and I'll think about more if that's, if that's what I'm, what I'm doing in, in numerous cases, but there, there's, there are different, there are different way, ways to arrive at um, these groupings and when you have less information to start with, you you can have more primitive groupings. Yeah. And that's that that's my way to, to introduce these things, you know. Right. But, but I, I, I understand the motivation of the question and we can go into the so in these cases the proof is in the pudding, you know. The the, the, the way I would explain we can both go through this because maybe you'll point out, you know, a, a mistake I'm making. But uh, the, the proof of, of it is to look at each concept that I try to introduce and see whether I really am just relying on the information I have. The information that came earlier. Yeah. So um, it's something to look for. But it's something I tried to do actually mm -hmm. very carefully, and so um, 
we can we can go through any one of them and see whether I succeeded. Yeah. Know? So if you, you, you'll see even that, that I that I say like when I when I start with that first concept of existence, I actually do a process of measurement or mission right then and there, and saying what I'm what I'm grouping and what I'm distinguishing it from, and it's it's not as advanced as a more advanced form of the concept but it's a way to have a more primitive uh version of the concept you know yeah so so um so i'm sympathetic to your your question um but i don't think it's I don't think your question points to an objection that can't be met. I think it points to a thing to look out for. And it's something that I I did look out for as I did the book and tried to handle. But we can go through individual ones and see whether I did. Cool. Okay. Okay. Yes. But you're talking specifically about the issue of abstractions from abstractions. And did I... Did I meet the prerequisites for each concept in that manner? Well, I, no, I didn't think about specific abstraction and abstraction, but I mm. thought specifically about what form can I hold this concept in right now? Mm-hmm. In what form yes. can I hold it in that, that might not be, and usually was not, oh. as sophisticated a form as when... Uh, an adult might have it. Mm. Or, or, um, or, or, not just an adult, as when someone who's old got more of his philosophy, you know, worked out. Um, so it was more general than abstraction from abstraction. It was more to the point of can't, it was again the logical order of, yeah. of, of the concept. So It's, it's by way of saying as well that you can, you, can, you can form a concept here and then you can form a wider concept or you can form a concept here and form a narrower concept from it. But there's also a way you can jump right to this other kind, more advanced concept, but have a more primitive version of it. That's also a possible. Yeah, and that last is what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's something I'll have to think about more. Yeah. So, but um, well, I'll let you go. But before. Yeah, um, that's a good cliffhanger for people yeah. to come back and hear next next time. Yeah, but uh, and and something something I've been meaning to say is um, just thank you for writing this book because oh. I because I know you oh, yeah. I mean. Yeah, I mean, you you put a ton of effort into it, and I've really benefited from it, and um, so I really appreciate you doing it, and uh, and I appreciate and and very few people are doing novel work using in philosophy, um, especially the people who are armed with the knowledge that makes them capable of doing that novel work, especially objectivists is what I'm saying. Um, there's just very, few, there's very few, there's very little of that. And, uh, it really fuels me to, to see that being done. So, uh, no, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. You know, just a, it makes me think this is why I started studying artificial intelligence because it, I came to think that, you know, maybe just by being in philosophy all these years trying to, be meticulous in what I'm doing, that I might I might be getting provincial. You know, I might have been provincial in that. There's a lot of discovery that's gone on in that other field, you know? And I need to I need to if I want to really if I really want to study epistemology, I need to study that. That's like studying uh, the notebooks of the modern day news, you know. Huh, wow. Okay. Well, that's quite an endorsement of them. Yeah, look at the things they're doing. They're yeah, it, it speaks for yeah. itself, actually. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But they also need people to understand it better because they often cannot explain why things work. Right. 
Yeah, right. And that will make them even more powerful if we can bring yeah, and, and broad and ideas. Why, why sometimes they don't. Mm. You know, sometimes sometimes the self-driving car crashes. Yep. On elementary things. Uh, I'm sure they'll be capable of much more once broader principles are brought to bear to their field. I hope so. Yeah. 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 So that's, you know... Well, cool. Anyway, yeah, keep at it. So, so thank, you, thank you so much, and I very much look forward to studying more of your physics. Well, I appreciate that, too. Anyway, I won't keep you any longer. Okay. Um, uh, All right. Thank you. Th- okay. Thanks a lot, Ron. Um, and um, All right. we'll set some thank else you, up. Thank James. Okay. Bye for now. See ya. So that was my second conversation with Ron Pizzaturo about his book, A Validation of Knowledge. Once again, if you'd like to buy the book, you can find a link to it in the video description. Thanks for watching.